It's a pleasure to welcome you to the second annual Innovations in Regulatory Science Summit on behalf of the organizing committee, which includes Kathy Giacomini, uh, Laura Esserman, George Skangos, and myself. The principal objective of this summit is to facilitate dialogue between all stakeholders in the innovation of safe and effective medical products. From the earliest conceptualization of this meeting several years ago, our goal has been to bring together leaders from academia, industry, the FDA, and all others interested in optimizing discovery, development, and assessment of novel medical products to help humankind. Another objective of this uh, summit is to highlight the power of regulatory science and discuss the importance of the centers of excellence in regulatory science and innovation. And also we hope to stimulate collaboration through networking. Of course, uh, this networking is much easier uh, if we have a, an in-person meeting such as the one we had last year on the UCSF campus. And we hope to be in person again in 2022 in San Francisco. You may ask why is this meeting held on a weekend day in early January? Well, the reason is that it is a pre-meeting uh, to one of the largest healthcare conferences in the world. And many of the individuals we hope to engage are, are present in San Francisco at this time. Last year, during the discussions on panels and also during the networking breaks, there was a lot of interest in having a panel and a focus on infectious diseases this year. And no one could have predicted how the next year would have unfolded, but I think everyone will agree that now more than ever before, the importance of cross-sector collaboration uh, to bring products to market that will deal with public, public health crises uh, such as the one we have are of paramount importance. This year's uh, summit uh, will begin with opening remarks from Stanford and UCSF leaders. We'll hear an overview of the UCSF Stanford Searcy from Kathy Giacomini. We'll hear keynote addresses from FDA leaders and lightning talks from Searcy investigators from our Searcy and also from Searcy's at other institutions throughout the United States and we'll have panel discussions on timely topics. We are delighted to welcome back UCSF Chancellor Sam Hoggood and Stanford President Mark Tessier-Levine to make opening remarks this year once again. <clears throat> and we welcome UC President Michael Drake, who will be on the pandemic preparedness panel. The first uh, panel will discuss the development assessment and repurposing of medical products for infectious diseases and will be co-chaired by Janet Woodcock and Rob Califf. It's noteworthy that Janet and Rob have been tremendous supporters of this meeting, not only by attending the meeting, but also by giving us advice on how to shape the meeting so that we can achieve our goals. The next panel uh, will be on uh, novel therapies for cancer uh, and will be co-moderated by Laura Esserman and Peter Marks. We'll then hear about pandemic preparedness, lessons learned from COVID-19, uh, moderated by Ann Wachitsky and Joe DeRisi. And finally, a very important topic, what is happening to research development and regulatory review of medical products for other indications during the COVID-19 pandemic? And this will be co-moderated by Jennifer Cochran and Andy Plump. We're, we're absolutely thrilled to have three center directors here to make keynote lectures this year. Uh, Janet Woodcock representing CEDAR will discuss the US clinical trial ecosystem. Peter Marks from CBER will discuss bespoke therapeutics and Jeff Shuren will give us an update from the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. We're also grateful for Amy Abernathy coming back uh, this year. Amy is principal deputy commissioner at FDA and we welcome Denise Hilton, the chief scientist, uh, Martha Donahue from Oncologic Diseases, and Patricia Cavazzoni, who is the acting director of CDER. We also want to thank our gold sponsors, uh, Merck, Verily, and Gilead, who've helped support this meeting. And last but certainly not least, uh, I want to thank Lawrence Lynn, who's director of external relations and outreach. Lawrence has done the heavy lifting for this meeting, and without Lawrence, there would be no meeting. So thank you, Lawrence, for all that you've done. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, UCSF Chancellor Sam Hoggood and Stanford President Mark Tessier-Levine, who will sequentially make opening remarks without me interrupting them. Sam, take it away. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone, and happy new year to you all. Uh, I want to uh, issue a warm welcome uh, to this second annual Innovations in Regulatory Science Summit. I'm certainly delighted to be here again and to be part of the great opportunity that this event provides. The UCSF Stanford Searcy represents an important partnership between the FDA and academia, working together as a team and sharing a collaborative vision 
that offers the ability to tackle large, complex problems, harness ideas, and leverage knowledge. I don't need to tell you all that 2020 was a particularly challenging year for all of us, including the FDA. In response to the COVID pandemic, the FDA were forced to accelerate their efforts to review and approve the many new diagnostic tests, vaccines, and therapeutics. And they had to do so at an unprecedented pace while halting the sale of over a thousand fraudulent or unproven medical products. To effectively evaluate and approve these new remedies, the FDA needed advice and new scientific information. The partnership formed by the FDA and CERCI became crucial. As the pandemic raged on, the FDA continues to sponsor large research projects through the UCSF Stanford CERCI. Just an example, focused on COVID-19, one project involved the design and implementation of an adoptive clinical trial known as iSpy COVID that could rapidly evaluate drugs for acute respiratory distress syndrome associated with COVID-19. A second pandemic project provided the tools to gather information from the point of care, which could then serve as data for both clinical care and research. This venture forwarded queries to UC's large clinical database established by the Baker Institute at UCSF and set up the infrastructure that enabled the FDA to rapidly obtain answers about COVID-19 associated morbidities and therapies. Now this year's summit represents the opportunity to further awareness about UCSF Stanford CERCI's importance in advancing research. This is taking place in an unprecedented time in regulatory science. The mission of improving health and finding better, safer, and less costly therapeutic medical devices, research tools, and software has never been more important. From diagnostics to sequencing to gene therapy and digital health, the UCSF Stanford CERCI is primed to assist the FDA in making informed regulatory decisions and sort through the myriad of new products being developed in the pandemic's wake. I noted at the start of 2020 that we are in the right place at the right time to redefine what's possible in science and medicine. Here we are, and the slowing down of regulatory science will only lead to a dangerous delay in therapeutic discoveries. The collaborative work of UCSF Stanford CERCI with the FDA has already delivered on its promise to bring discoveries to patients quicker. And we have learned firsthand that engaging in regulatory science will be critical for future leaders. Now, while moving the discovery needle, the UCSF Stanford CERCI is training the next generation of scientific leaders, providing industry expertise, mentorship, and business strategy. The further cultivation of the CERCI partnership will allow for the innovation of safe and effective therapies and will provide a quicker pathway to get them to patients who are greatly in need. So again, I thank you all for joining us today, and I certainly look forward to today's discussion. I'll now turn it over uh, to Mark. Great. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you uh, so much, Sam, and thank you also, Koldev, and good morning to everyone. It's really wonderful to be gathered with so many scientists and thinkers from across academia, industry, and government. Uh, although I wish we could be together in person, this event provides an outstanding and timely opportunity to focus on how to further medical innovation for the benefit of patients in need. Together, the academic, industry, and regulatory sectors are the engines of medical innovation. By bringing all three sectors to the table, this summit will help us better understand the challenges and complexities involved in regulatory science and medical product development and advance our efforts to partner more effectively in the development, the approval, and the monitoring of medical products. Now, Coldef has provided a terrific overview of the day ahead, and Sam has highlighted some of the very tangible impacts that the UCSF Stanford Center of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation has had in the past year. I'd just like to make two additional points to amplify their comments. First, 
I want to underscore again the wisdom and foresight of the FDA in creating the CIRCE program, which is such a thoughtful and innovative model of collaboration in all three of its areas of focus. In, in research, programs are co-led by a PI from the FDA and a PI from one of our two academic institutions and very deliberately focused on mission critical projects that address FDA's immediate scientific needs. And the scientific exchange and education programs directly stimulate interactions between FDA scientists and academic scientists and train the next generation of young talent that will help take our medical innovation enterprise to the next level. The program was thoughtfully and pragmatically designed to address key gaps in the biomedical translational infrastructure in our country. And its success should inspire us to ask, what other gaps are there in our country's infrastructure that we should seek to address with the same thoughtfulness and pragmatism. And this brings me to my second point. When we met a year ago at the first summit on innovations in regulatory science, we discussed the many opportunities ahead for further improving the translational ecosystem and infrastructure. None of us foresaw, however, that COVID would disrupt the world so profoundly, harming so many people across the globe and laying bare glaring inequities in impacts and in access to healthcare for diverse populations, both in our country and around the world. But as wrenching as this year has been, we've also been inspired by how our national and international biomedical communities, including academia, the private and philanthropic sectors and government, responded with collective vigor, innovation and partnership to combat the pandemic. Who would have thought a year ago that in less than 12 months, a panoply of diagnostic tests and multiple novel therapeutics and vaccines would be both created and delivered to patients. Making these advances, all of us in this room witnessed how the traditional barriers to collaboration and to advancing discovery and translation, the many logistical, legal, and even cultural barriers were tackled and overcome in breathtaking record time to unleash and accelerate innovation and to bring it to fruition. This has been a remarkable accomplishment in and of itself, but it also provides an extraordinary opportunity to learn how to reduce these barriers permanently for the next wave of innovation that's needed, both for the current pandemic, but also for the many, many other poorly treated diseases that will remain our focus as the pandemic recedes. That's the opportunity in front of us today, quite literally today in this meeting, to begin setting the stage for long lasting improvements to the translational infrastructure. And I would submit that it's not just an opportunity, it's actually our charge, our responsibility to learn the lessons of the past year and with the same rigor and practical outlook that the FDA brought to bear in crafting the CIRCE program a decade ago to develop systems and programs that will forever improve our ability to translate scientific advance into therapies and cures for patients in need. And that's why I'm so excited about this meeting today. And I want to thank the organizing committee for being so thoughtful in how they structured the meeting. So many thanks to Kuldef Singh from Stanford, Kathy Giacomini and Laura Esserman from UCSF, and George Skangos from Veer Biotechnology. You've put together a meeting that will enable us to launch this process of reflection and reform. I also want to thank the many wonderful speakers who are joining us today to share their insights and their help in this quest. And thank you all once again for your contributions to this work and for being here for this series of essential conversations. And now let's get to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Sam. And also thank you, Cool Dev. My name is Kathy Giacomini and I'm the co-PI of the UCSF Stanford CIRCE along with Russ Altman at Stanford. What I thought I'd do today is describe some of the activities of our CIRCE with a particular focus on our research mission. As everyone on this webinar knows, the FDA not only evaluates and approves drugs and a myriad of other medical products, but it has an important research mission. And that research mission is to generate new knowledge that helps them make uh, better decisions. Um, the new knowledge informs FDA guidances, standards, policies, and practices, as well as their approval and monitoring processes. So to help them in their research mission, FDA is supporting currently supporting four centers of excellence in regulatory science and innovation, CIRCES, one at the University of Maryland, one at Johns Hopkins, and two multi-campus centers, Yale University Mayo Clinic and the UCSF Stanford CIRCE. All of these centers conduct collaborative and mission critical research with FDA scientists, not the traditional academic curiosity 
driven research. Um, and that's what makes these, um, this unique collaborative model work extremely well. FDA leverages the enormous scientific powerhouses of academia to advance their research mission. Currently, um, currently FDA is supporting 40 research projects in the UCSF Stanford Searcy, about half with Stanford faculty and half with UCSF faculty and all partnered with FDA scientists. Today, all of the Searcy's um, today, all of the Circes will be presenting. Move that back. Today, all of the Circes will be presenting short lightning talks during the lunch hour, describing a spectrum of research across diverse medical products. So be sure to stay tuned um, to those. Uh, to those. Um, in this slide, I would like to just show you the great diversity of collaborative research topics that UCSF Stanford Searcy is supporting. And so we're supporting like a number of projects on patient preference, some projects on real world data and pharmacovigilance, several projects on clinical trials, optimizing these medical devices, diagnostics, biologics, and of course, COVID-19, as was pointed out earlier. So what I thought I'd do today um, in this short time um, is to highlight five examples of specific research conducted by our Circe in collaboration with scientists at the FDA. And as you will see, supporting the Circes really represents a quadruple win for the FDA as they gain essential new knowledge. For academic scientists, it gives us an opportunity to work on important problems with large effects on patients. For medical product developers, it helps inform and improve their development pipelines and most importantly for the public, as it provides them with better, safer medical products, including vaccines, diagnostics, drugs, and devices. My first example of a collaborative Searcy research project is focused on how we can improve um, electronic data collection systems for clinicians and healthcare providers who either participate in or would like to participate in clinical trials, but currently find it too burdensome. As you know, Clinicians participating in clinical trials are burdened with two electronic data entry systems. They first have to enter data for caring for their patients in their institutional electronic health records, their EHRs. But they also, if they're participating in a clinical trial, have to complete a second set of data entries for the clinical trial database for that same patient. It's too much for most physicians and other clinicians who already have enough paperwork to do that burden excludes many smaller hospitals and healthcare systems that cannot afford to pay for extra help. It results in immense healthcare disparities and an inequitable effect on the American public, as some have access to clinical trials, whereas most do not. Our Searcy through CEDAR is funding um, Laura Esserman at UCSF and her team to work with FDA scientists to harmonize EPIC, one of the major electronic health record systems with clinical trial databases and entry systems so that there will be one point of entry where clinicians can enter the data and have it populate both the EHR and the clinical trial database. Their re research will make it so much easier for physicians and other healthcare professionals even out in rural communities or poor urban areas to participate and will greatly accelerate clinical trials and expand access for all Americans. The second um, collaborative study I would like to highlight is one focused on drug-drug interactions. I think everyone out there is aware of how serious drug-drug interactions may be, causing huge problems in drug safety. Many of you will remember the interaction of one of the early statins, cerevastatin, Baycol, with a fibrate, gemfibrazole, which contributed to the removal of cerevastatin from the market many years ago because of life-threatening drug toxicities. The Office of Clinical Pharmacology in CEDAR, Center for Drug Evaluation at the FDA, through research collaborations with my laboratory and others, have worked to develop and standardize in vitro methods to predict clinical drug-drug interactions. While not perfect, these methods have greatly improved the ability of drug developers to predict clinical drug-drug interactions and conduct the right clinical trials. Results of this research were used to inform new FDA guidances published this, well, published in 2020 on the use of in vitro studies to predict drug-drug interactions. We are now working with FDA scientists on in vivo biomarkers that can be measured in early phase one trials to predict clinically important drug-drug interactions that should result in vast 
improvements, once again in drug safety. The third example I would like to highlight exemplifies the FDA's focus on including patient input into their regulatory decisions. And we're funding seven, or we're supporting several of these projects through our CIRCES. For example, right now there is a plethora of new devices that seek to reduce patient use of and dependence on opiate analgesics such as codeine or morphine. The FDA is interested in including input from patients on how they weigh the risk and benefits of these devices. Um, the risk being that they may be in some pain, but the benefit is they may avoid a lifelong opiate addiction. This is an extremely nuanced patient preference, but very important. Sean Mackey and his colleagues at Stanford working with FDA silent scientists in the Center for, um, um, for, radio, for Devices and Radiologic Health are engaging in group discussions with patients to get qualitative information from them, as well as developing quantitative surveys focused on what the risk benefit has to be for the patients. The discussions involve patients with chronic pain on opiates, those uh, with chronic pain uh, uh, not on opiates, and those who were formerly on opiates and may have developed product problems with addiction. We are very excited about this project as we feel it will help in the evaluation of a host of new medical products that will help reduce the current opiate addiction crisis. The fourth collaborative project I would like to highlight exemplifies the FDA's need to understand mutations in microorganism and is very apropos for today's symposium. HIV is caused by a retrovirus, which has an extremely high mutation rate. In fact, about 100 circulating recombinant forms of HIV have been identified in patient samples. Emergence of new variant forms may affect the epidemic in specific regions of the world and then spread globally. So as part of public health preparedness, there is a need for surveillance of new HIV strains and other co-infecting viruses. So Charles Chu at UCSF is a leader in the use of next-gen metagenomic sequencing methods to discover, um, detect and discover emerging pathogens. And FDA Center for Biologics um, Evaluation and Research is sharing 800 blood samples from infected patients with the Chu Laboratory. And the Chu Laboratory is planning to sequence the samples and detect strains of HIV, which may be mutant, and other viruses, as well as discover non-viral microbes that are co-infected, for example, tuberculosis or malaria. We're very excited about this project as there is an urgent need to discover novel viruses, mutant strains, and other pathogens for the health of the people in the US and globally. The final um, collaborative project that I would like to um, highlight is, involves a computational scientist at UCSF, Atul Butte. The COVID pandemic has ushered in a new awareness of the threats of microorganisms and the need to be able to respond to these threats and to a myriad of new treatments rapidly. Real world questions need to be answered in real time. Example questions include the history and symptoms of COVID-19, the impact of a myriad of treatments and real world performance of diagnostic tests. To answer such questions, FDA through the Office of the Commissioner partnered with Atul. Atul has developed a statewide electronic health record which knits together health systems from five UC academic medical centers, including 12 hospitals. The system is research ready and termed UC Health Data Warehouse. The goal of this project now is to develop a rapid query model to address prioritized COVID-19 questions from the FDA, which will help them immensely in their public health mission. So I think you can see that our CIRCE collaborative research projects represents a quadruple win for FDA, for academic scientists, for medical product developers, and most importantly, for patients. Um, in addition to research, our CIRCE sponsors educational and outreach activities, including fellowship programs shown here, a CIRCE immersion course in drug development and regulatory science, and we sponsor an FDA visiting scientist program, currently virtual. Let me, um, uh, end and thank everyone and um, and I want to thank all of you and I want to um, thank our industry 
uh, sponsors. Um, so thank you all very much. And I would now like to turn over um, this talk to our first um, keynote speaker.